Okay. Okay. Don't, don't, don't speak, please. Sorry. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we continue our Hellenic education with the professor John Hadzopoulos. And today we have the second lesson. Mr. Hadzopoulos, you have the floor. Okay, thank you, Mr. Coordinator, Dimitri. Let me take the screen. Do you see the screen? Yes. 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 Yes, we do. The second transparency? No, no. just no. the title, just the first one, not the second. The okay, you see the second, all right? No. No. No? Now is the first. Yes, yes. the first. Now is the second. Is the no. title? No. No? No. no. Something, no. Go something goes wrong. <laughs> Do you see now the second okay. one? No, yes. No. Yes. No, yes. Okay. yes. Yes. The third, go the fourth. On, go on. Okay, okay, go, go. On. Yeah, we're up to the math part. Okay. Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Hellenic Education Second Lecture. And uh, I'm going to say a few things about the first lecture. There is uh, the corrected version in the YouTube, as you can see here. We covered in the first lecture, introduction to the internal balanced Plato's model and the laboratory we practice the internal external balance. We may summarize the lab uh, coverage there. You we moved about again. Human conscious. You moved it Pardon again. Me? Okay, okay. Go on. Okay. We, we covered in the lab also, we talk about human consciousness and the lack of critical thinking and the loopholes of the current uh, legalities and the need to restart the education system. Therefore, we made some progress in the lab and uh, we have to stay into the bounds of internal and uh, external balance to practice that in, in the lab. And uh, this is something which is not easy because we are not familiar with it. And this is the purpose of this class to get familiar. In today's second lesson, we are going to cover both in the lecture, internal and external balance. At the end, we talk about a little bit more about Aristotle's model. The topics we are going to cover are listed here. You can see the transparency, all right, with the 11 topics. Do you? Yes. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so, Hellenic education, desire and anger management, uh, mind space components and virtuous mind or virtuous person about mathematics. We are going to cover the structure of the circle and uh, working with graphics, illustrations, and relationships. Also, we are going to use some mathematics for the internal balance and uh, give some graphs. Mm -hmm. And because the, there are involved some vector equations there, we're going to say a few things about trigonometry. And uh, at the end, we, we talk a little bit more about the external balance and the mind space of virtue. 
Now, in the lab last time, we, excuse me, in the lab, we are going to cover the miserable so Victor Goer, Lenny has prepared that. And you can see here the information that we may, you may get uh, access to uh, this story. About mathematics, we said it's the science of the structures and help us to make analysis of structures, establish relationships and uh, view the relationships through graphs. The relationships help us to write equations and relate uh, parameters that we know or we don't know or we can measure with, to other parameters we don't know and we can calculate. And this is very important for philosophy structures because there are lots of parameters we don't know and if we can establish such relationships, we can calculate them. We are going to give an example here about uh, the geometrical structure of the circle, which is very easy to, to make a circle on the ground with a piece of thread and the nail to put down, to, to tie the thread on the ground and the pin on the other end. You can see here, here is the nail, here is the pin. We go around and we do the circle. All we need, all we know to do that is the length of the thread, which is the radius of the circle. It's given here an example, the radius 2.18 meters, and we want to calculate the area and the perimeter. Area and perimeter is very hard to measure it, okay? But we can calculate it very easily. How here is the relationships? For instance, the area is equal to the constant pi, which is 3.14, multiplied by the r, the radius square. And this is the result, 14.93 square meters. The perimeter is uh, two times the pi, again, 3.14, multiplied by the radius, and it is 13.70 meters. So things with it's difficult to measure you find out their value you can see how we can get them very precisely doing the calculation now having the graphs we can uh, illustrate uh, here with the graphs the relationships we have the radius has been the independent variable and we give to the radius various values from zero to five. And uh, we calculate the dependent variables, area and perimeter here. And you can see the values we calculate. So having these uh, values here, we can do the plotting and get the graph. Okay, this is the graph of the area with various values of the radius here. Here is the corresponding values of the area. And uh, you can see it's a curve because we have a second degree equation here. You see R square. While the perimeter is a first degree equation, we have a straight line. Again, here is the values of the radius and the values of the, the calculated values of the perimeter. Now we are going to make an example using coordinates because we are going to use coordinates with the mind space in the next lecture, we'll talk about it. And uh, what we do with coordinates, we have um, an axis X and uh, an axis of Y perpendicular to each other. And the intersection is the zero value for both axes. So we can measure, we can put, uh, some distances here in the x axis. And if we know the equation for instance of the circle, we can get the, the values of the perimeter. Actually, this example uh, is uh, an actual uh, work I did in my yard. I have an olive tree you see here. And I wanted to put the bricks uh, exactly in a circle around the tree. But it's, uh, I cannot put a nail here, draw a circle on the ground. So I know the equation of the circle. 
and uh, I can give uh, values to the, the X and calculate the values for the Y, as you can see in this case here. If we put the uh, coordinate system at the center of the circle, the equation of the circle is this one. Y is equal this part. But we want the coordinate system to be here, okay? So the equation of the circle uh, becomes uh, just adding to this quantity, the R. Okay, this is the equation of the circle. And we, you see, we give values to the X here and we calculate for each value of the X, we calculate two values for the Y. Okay, you see one here, one we, uh, with the value of uh, X being equal to one, we calculate values for the Y two and 0.5. If you go here to the one, you see this is 0 0.5, the, the value, and this is the value of two. These two values come from this plus and my, or, or minus sign. The plus sign gives the one value and the minus sign gives the other value. Okay, that's the reason for one single value of the X here. You have two values for the Y and uh, that's if you give a value to the X you calculate two values for the Y. For this, um, with this method, I was able to put uh, the points on the ground around the tree and draw the circle and put the bricks, as you can see, in the right position. Now, uh, we said uh, also, the, and we are going to repeat many times in this uh, course, that um, we have two models here. These two models are basic for Hellenic education. This is, you know, all the foundation for Hellenic education. It is these two models. The platonic of internal balance, where the logic balances desire and anger. And the Aristotelian or external balance, which is the mid space of virtue where thoughts and actions are neither incomplete or defective nor exaggerated or excessive. And they model the human error. Non virtue is uh, prejudice, uh, deception, and uh, we are talking about uh, slave uh, uh, because someone is a slave of the desires, the anger, and the inadequacy of logic to provide the reason of what uh, Toxor is doing, what Toxor does. Now, design anger management, uh, it is something I believe should be taught in uh, the school at all, at all levels. And uh, we can say a few things here about excessive desire is greed, uh, envy, jealousy, fear, etc., vanity, defective desire, deception, uh, depression, excuse me, suicide, envy, jealousy, uh, the same things like here could be also defective. Uh, excessive anger is acts of distraction without logical explanation. And we can see that uh, this is not, it's an evil thing, but not always, not in self-defense or defense. And effective anger, uh, we have soft uh, behavior, lack of uh, reaction to the disturbances of internal and external balance, which is very, very important to know. Now for the internal balance, we said uh, this is the example given by Plato and some other also Greek creators that uh, desire is a blind horse and uh, anger is a crazy horse. And the logic is the coachman that tries to drive these two horses into the way of virtue. And uh, therefore we have a balance of forces here. Okay, anger is one force, the red uh, force. Desire is another force, and the addition of these two forces is the logic 
for the balancing of these two forces is the logic, as you can see, according to the Plato's model here. Of course, we can uh, also take into consideration the Aristotle's maybe way of virtue. And if we take that into consideration, we may say that the logic is not necessary to balance exactly these two forces, but could be a little bit less or a little bit more. And that defines the midway, the mid space of virtue. Okay. And this is the acceptably correct uh, logic to get uh, these two uh, forces into the, the virtue, which is how human mind actually could uh, also work out. And uh, we need to have anger management in this particular case, desire management within the mid space of, of virtue. Now let's uh, see how we balance forces in physics. Okay, graphically, we can balance forces use, uh, working with this parallelogram and the diagonal is the balancing uh, force. Because we have, uh, th these are a vector balance, vector equation, we need to describe this balance and the vector equation is this one. As you can see, is the balance in logic square is, is equal to the desire square, anger square, multiplied these two things by the cosine of this angle of theta. Now, if we are in a rectangular system, we are going to talk about that in the next lecture. We are, we are going to have this kind of balance, then you would do need the cosine of theta. And uh, since we talk about cosine, we are. Uh, we need to know a little bit about trigonometry. Trigonometry has six uh, defined uh, terms, sine, cosine, tangent, cotangent, uh, second, cosecant. But actually, if you know the sine and the cosine, you can see here all the others are functions of the cosine, sine and cosine. How they are defined, the sine is the opposite. For instance, the sine of uh, any angle theta is if you have an orthogonal triangle is equal to the uh, opposite side to the hypotenusa, okay? Opposite side B by the hypotenusa. Cosine is of the same angle theta is the adjacent side, this C over the hypotenusa, C over the hypotenusa. And uh, if you have, a, say, any angle uh, that is, you know, you don't have a triangle, just you can take a perpendicular from any point here to there, measure these two lengths and get the sine and the cosine. So it's very easy to do it. Now, let's move into the external balance, the mid space of uh, Aristotle's virtue, which models the human error because this one uh, also we are going to talk in the next lectures uh, to analyze it. Virtue, as we said, uh, is a mid space, not a mean. Lots of philosophers, they call it mean, it's not a mean. And it is found between two extreme positions or vices. The one is in this uh, underestimation of virtue and it is the defect. At the other end is the overestimation or excess. And the example that Aristotle gives in the Nicomachean Ethics, in his book Nicomachean Ethics, is about fears and courage, virtue is amid space. Actually, we may say that courage is in the is amid space between uh, coward and the provocative. And the same thing we may say about thrifty is the mid space between stinginess and overspending. Or we may, if we try to model the human error, we, uh, we may say that mid space of virtue is when the human error is less than a threshold limit. And this uh, mid space, we may call it uh, acceptable uh, virtuous performance or virtuous person, etc. 
Now, virtue is an effort, according to Aristotle. It's not, nobody could be exactly within these, these two limits, but is the effort by trying to be within these limits. And uh, of course, someone should uh, learn uh, from the mistakes and errors, etc. And finally, to be able, and it is a practice of the entire life to be within the limits, to try to be within the limits. And uh, anytime anybody wants to be virtuous could do it. It's, uh, uh, there are equal opportunities and never is late. I want to emphasize that. Now, mid space of virtue is the limits of tolerance of the rule. We said that nature has laws and rules, but the rules are the ones they guide the performance of the nature objects. And uh, we may say that the error is the error variance in the performance of the nature objects, the mid spatial virtue. And the variance actually is the, uh, it's a parameter of the design of nature in order to have diversity and evolution. If everything would be perfect, we wouldn't have diversity or, evol or uh, evolution. And uh, some people, they say that nature uh, does mistakes uh, because bad things happen. No, they are part of the design to have diversity and evolution. Nature is perfect. Now, because everybody would think that these uh, virtue limits, mid space limits, are, you know, have a different opinion about them, how we uh, put these boundaries? Uh, we can do it through the democratic process. And this is the way we define what is democracy and democratic process. But the people uh, participating in this process in order to have meaning to define these limits, okay, must be virtues with minimal bias, as you can see here. Now let's give a more, um, uh, say, a better example about what uh, midway, mid the space of virtue is. Let's consider this uh, horse that tries to go over this obstacle here. The foot has to be over the obstacle, but not too much because in either case may have problem, okay? So over here is going to have a false step and over here may the over throw the, the rider. So there is a mid space here that uh, the rise of the foot is uh, correct, okay? Or we may say that one point within the mid space is the absolute correct. Maybe the average of all um, successful uh, uh, passes through the obstacle. Uh, and uh, this is the mid space of virtue. And we may call it the acceptably, the acceptably correct uh, uh, mid space or space, whatever we want to call it. Now, this is the upper limit. And uh, out of this limit, we have excess, excessiveness or excess. And we may call it, uh, if we want to use, we have to use later, or with the positive sign, okay, over this limit. Uh, oh, uh, down from this limit, okay, we may call it defect, defect and uh, we may call it error with a negative sign, okay? Because we are going to use these terms in the next uh, lectures. Uh, again, I want to emphasize that in nature we have laws and rules and the rules are the ones we, that uh, guide the uh, functioning of the objects. And uh, the rules have tolerance limits and the exceptions. We said that it is because of the diversity and evolution. It's part of the design of the universe. And we 
have an example that like the planetary system works with this uh, balance. And uh, we said that uh, the supreme rule is the rule of balance that contains all the rules. And that's why we're talking about the planetary system, the stomach, for instance, the acids could, could be within limits, the heartbeats must be within limits, the blood pressure must be within limits. Outside of these limits, we have uh, sickness. And in human behavior, outside of this limit, you have evil, evil, uh, evil uh, things happening. And uh, we may say that whatever disturbs the internal and external balance is evil. Okay, we, we have to expect uh, bad things to happen. And uh, if we take a look also how these bad things happen is when we have excess or defect of desire, anger, and logic. And uh, we may consider also the role of the media on that. For instance, propaganda either uh, does excess or uh, defect of certain things just to guide people into what uh, they want to, uh, to do. Now, because uh, we had some uh, religious uh, issues um, privately discussed in this course, I want to, to make uh, clear that uh, this course is for everybody. Uh, we try not to involve uh, with the religious, but uh, a lot of subjects, you know, they contain some uh, parameters of religious, even the, uh, the readings we have in the laboratory. So therefore, uh, what I want to say that those who believe in God, we assume that God is uh, father of all people, is uh, the creator, okay? And uh, we carry, therefore we carry the God ourselves. And if we want to, approach the God, what we need to do is either with the, uh, to be virtuous, virtuous people, or to do exploration and explore the creation. Okay? Because all the, the kind, all the creation we see around us, if we assume there is a God, okay, created by God. So if we uh, do that and the uh, internal and the uh, external balance we cover in this course is actually an exploration of the creation. The ancient Greek philosophers developed this approach as an ecumenical standard, but uh, it was not promoted uh, as the foundation of education and this is what we do. And I'm talking about internal and external balance. Now, another thing I want to emphasize is about justice. Justice, according to Aristotle, is the supreme virtue that contains all virtues. And uh, it is represented by, by a blind goddess that holds a balance. And whoever disturbs the balance is the guilty. The same thing, we have to look at uh, internal and external balance. Whoever disturbs that is the guilty. And if, if we want to work towards a better society to see who, who does the disturbances there. This is why the current education system has failed. And it is the novice idea in this class, of course, we are not uh, familiar and take time to, to adapt it, the internal and external balance. And uh, this is the lab. Uh, as I said, we, we have to conform with this table in the lab, the discussion, to have the characters on the one column and uh, to talk about internal balance or uh, specific character, external balance and the consequences. Okay. And uh, this is the end of the lecture. Let me see. Okay.
if you have uh, questions re related to the lecture, please feel free to ask me. Otherwise, I give the floor to the oh, coordinator. I, I have something to say. Okay. Um, I would like to explain that according to the uh, Pythagorean alphabetic system, the number P derives from the word cycle circumstances length, which according to the lexicon gives us the sum of 2,294 and the word diameter, diameter gives us the number 730. And if in 2,294, we divide it by seven, uh, seven, uh, seven, uh, 730, we get the, the question three and 14. That's all uh, for about the uh, Pythagorean alphabetic system. And I explained that the, the, the word P is this one, the result of three and uh, 14. Thank you. Uh, Dimitri, I have told you before that uh, this is a mistake of Pythagoras because the pi 3.14 is not a rational number all right yes approximately okay. approximately, approximately it yes. is 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 the result yeah if, if you divide it, the 22 by 7 you get well, uh, approximately I have, yes. I have it in my in my heart and I, I learned it and I keep it and I say that Pythagoras okay. was right approximately it was the result yeah. that was uh, three and fourteen. Yeah. Okay, Dimitris. <laughs> any any other question? Or no more. Comment? No more. Okay, uh, Dimitri, give the floor to Helen to do to work with the lab. I need, I need to share my my uh, presentation. Please, Mr. Helen. Okay, don't take too long, too much time. I, I know, but. Uh, give me the per permission to share my presentation. I give the permission oh, or I, I Dimitris? Got, okay, I have it. Thank you. Uh, just a moment. Yeah, um, I have made you find go forth. You, you, you may go on. Let me find it. Here we go. Okay. Uh, let me do. Okay. Can everybody see this? Yes. Yes. Oh, good. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let me just. Uh, uh, I, I just want to see everybody as well. Okay. Um, it, it's really um, been a privilege for me to listen to uh, Professor Hazopoulos and try in my mind to connect these concepts with this amazing work of fiction. It, it's, uh, I, I've never thought of reading literature through a platonic and Aristotelian filter. So it's, bear with me. This is a, a little bit difficult for me. So I'm just going to go through this and, and maybe as we finish this part of the presentation, we can discuss how it, we can relate the characters and their actions, and their char uh, and their, uh, their their actions, the characters, their uh, personalities to the uh, principles that we're discussing. So, um, the great novel *Les Misérables* of Victor Hugo, written in 1862, when he was in exile. Um, uh, by the French government at the time, who was it? Uh, Napoleon III. And one of the uh, episodes in this marvelous uh, book is the episode of the uh, candlesticks and the silver tableware, etc. Uh, just a, a, a small quote 
from what Hugo said um, in Latin and then in English translation, life itself is an exile, uh, something to ponder. <laughs> um, this uh, episode reveals the complexity of thoughts of Hugo, uh, Hugo's Jean Valjean and the absolute lack of thinking that way in the bishop, but, but I, I'll explain that in a moment. I, I don't want you to think that I'm not, I'm not saying that the bishop doesn't think at all, but I think it's part of his character. So I'm going to uh, go to the next, uh, go to the next slide. Uh, I, can't bit of your, I can't see your, I don't know if anyone else, but I can't see the slides. Uh, I see your desktop. Oh. Oh, then he's muted. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. I just can't. I don't know about anyone else, but I just see your, your, I don't see the slides. I don't know if everyone else. You I don't see. No. I don't see the slides either. Yeah. So you have to just open your, so you, are you doing like Mr. Rob candlesticks? You just have I to. I am. It says that I'm screen sharing them right now. It's, okay. it's probably behind your desktop. Like you might want to okay. minimize. Okay. And, and make, and make okay. the other one. Let's see if I can maybe um, stop the share. Let me stop the share. Let me open um, it to the desktop. The the slides. Okay. Let me open. I, it, 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 usually it okay. So the file should be open, Ellen. The, the slides are open. They are open. Okay. Can, so now, can... now I'm going to do it again. I'm Share. going. To... Can you see them now? Okay. Yes. Now it's yes. okay. Now it's oh. fine. Okay. Oh my gosh. So can you, yep. can you, yeah. can you see my first slide? Yep. Yes. Got it. We got All it. Right. That's what I was talking about. I'm going to yep. go forward. Um, okay, uh, a little bit of background of, of the setting, uh, but you've all read this, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, with these uh, chapters. Uh, and we know the, the background of the story of Jean Valjean. Uh, he was imprisoned unjustifiably 20 years. He's been turned away. Um, he's, he's out of prison now, penniless. He has been turned away from inns and homes. People have said, go away. We don't want to look at you. He's ugly, he's dirty, et cetera. And finally, he finds himself at, a, a bish at the bishop's home. Uh, it's a, a comfortable bishop and the door is open to him. He comes in. Uh, the, the permission is given uh, for him to enter uh, by the servant lady who has gotten permission from the bitch, from the bishop. Okay, so uh, we have a few themes now that that come up in this in this episode. Uh, his redemption. It's a, it's a very important uh, theme because up to this point, he feels he is lost. He has nothing in left in his life. Uh, he has been uh, imprisoned and sentenced uh, by a very capricious uh, system of justice. And uh, everything that he's experienced since his release from prison has been very negative. So at this, po at this point, when he is arriving in this home and given a bed, uh, this is a, a moment of redemption for him. Um, themes of lightness and darkness, passing uh, into light, um, etc. We're going to move into um, the characters. Uh, Jean Valjean is constantly asking himself, who am I? The bishop is constantly thinking of himself. I am his instrument. In other words, he is focused not on himself, on his ego, but being a servant of God. The servant, Madame Maglar, 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 I always get her name wrong, Maglar, uh, 
Uh, the servant is a, a, a very religious woman, and she, of course, obeys the, uh, obeys the um, wishes of the bishop. Jaber is not in the readings I asked you to do, but I assume Jerome and Stella and the others, I assume that you know who he is. Um, he was actually modeled the character, the way he was written. Hugo modeled him after Robespierre, who was in charge of the Committee of Public Safety. 50,000 people at least were beheaded under his uh, authority. He believed that swift and brutal justice would produce virtue among the citizens of France, a belief, <clears throat> a belief shared by the character of Javert. And um, he, he is, I think, this character we, we needed to we needed to discuss uh, Javert because he is an important character. Okay. So, um, so Valjean is a man no worse than any other man, as he explains to Javert at one point. The critical difference between the two is that Valjean is willing to live out a life of mercy. He's willing to live out a life of mercy after his epiphany at the bishop's house. He's willing to give and receive it while Javert can do neither. Valjean offers, when Valjean offers him mercy, saving his life at the barricade, this happens later on, he becomes a tormented man, his system is broken, his God is dead, his world crashes down, he plunges into the river committing suicide. Valjean, unlike Javert, looks up with shame into the eyes of the bishop after the redemptive moment, whom he has just stolen from choosing to accept mercy, giving it in return to other characters that come later, Fantine, Cosette, to Marius and even to his enemy Javert. Okay, uh, so now we uh, we look. Uh, uh, we, we're going to look at a little bit into um, uh, some of the. I, I, I'm always trying to bring this story back to the discussion. So. Uh, I, and, and in order to do that, I, I'm going to have to uh, describe Javert, who you, you haven't read. You, I'm sure you have in the past, so you know who he is. And for him, he is committed to the rules and his duties. The good and the true is found in the law, not only the law of France, but also the law of God as reflected in the order of the universe. Uh, it's the ethical theory is called deontology and use it uses rules to distinguish right from wrong. Its opposite is consequentialism, which judges actions by their results. Uh, I don't think we know we need to look at this. It's my favorite uh, to look at this soliloquy of Javert uh, because of time. I need to get back to the episode. But in this soliloquy, in the story of Les Miserables, he, he really uh, expresses his understanding of his place in the universe. His place is simply to enforce the rules. He's not there to understand how and why the rules are made. He's not uh, working uh, to understand the results of the rule, he could care less about the results. If you remember, uh, if you remember the uh, how did how did uh, Jean Valjean end up getting twenty years in prison? Well, you you know, and I'll just mention it: is stealing bread. So Javert doesn't care about why a man ends up being in prison for twenty years. He simply enforces the law. Madame uh, Maglar is also a very interesting character. Uh, it's chapter three is that is, is titled The Heroism of Passive Obedience. That's how Victor Hugo titles his passage. 
does the title reflect her nature? And I have a small quote here uh, from right before uh, Jean Valjean's entry into the home, into the bishop's home. The door opened. It opened wide with rapid movement as though someone had given it an energetic and resolute push. A man entered, we already know the man. It was the wayfarer whom we have seen wandering about in search of shelter. He entered, advanced a step and halted, leaving the door open behind him. He had his knapsack on his shoulders, his cudgel in his hand. Remember the cudgel was used uh, by the uh, workers in the mines uh, to cut away at rock uh, or uh, coal or whatever they were doing. A rough, audacious, weary, violent expression in his eyes. 20 years he's been in prison. The fire on the hearth lighted him up. He was hideous. It was a sinister apparition. Madame Magloire had not even the strength to utter a cry. She trembled and stood with her mouth wide open. And yet she opens the door to him because she is following the instructions of the bishop. So he, uh, he goes to the bed. Uh, Jean Valjean is given a bed to sleep in. He's never slept in a real bed. Uh, after awakening in the bishop's house, he believes it's the priest. He believes it's a simple priest at this point. He doesn't know that it's a bishop. Um, whether that means anything or not is important, I think, to his character. But I mention it here because it is important um, in terms of what he has done, what he does when he steals. Valjean ponders both the bishop and the silver, how its monetary value could change his life. Quote, he had observed six sets of silver forks and spoons and the ladle which Madame Magloire had placed on the table. Uh, these sets of silver haunted him, they were there. A few paces distant, just as he was traversing the adjoining room to reach the one in which he then was, the old servant women had been in the act of placing them in a little cupboard. Uh, he had taken careful note of the cupboard on the right, as you entered from the dining room, they were solid and old silver, old silver. From the later, one could get at least 200 francs, double what he had earned in 19 years. It is true that he would have earned more if the administration had not robbed him. At this point, he's still, uh, he still, um, uh, he has a great antagonism towards the government and that has that, that sentenced him to 20 years in prison. He seemed prepared to crush that skull or to kiss that hand. And he's talking about the bishop here in order to steal the silver. So what happens is uh, he wakes up in the middle of the night. Uh, you read the passage, I'm sure, where he goes through a tremendous thought process of how and what he should do. He takes his shoes off. He walks into the other room. He's almost hypnotized at this point. He, he, he knows that this, uh, this silver is there. He knows that, he, uh, that it could give him a start in a new Eleni. life. Eleni. And he knows that he needs to do, okay, yes. Yeah, we, you exceeded the time limit. Okay, and that's why I'm going to the next slide. No, so the, we, we, we all know what he does. We know we, that he, he steals we know it. The story, the story but, is given for people to study. Well, I, I know, we, I'm just, I, 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 may I just, excuse me, may I just summarize it before I continue? I'm, I'm going to summarize it. So. He, we know that he steals it. We know that he escapes. He's brought back. And the bishop, of course, says that he gave him the silver. Uh, so let's go to the final slide. And, and what we have here as um, maybe I would like you to help me. I'm not going to do this by myself, but I will help in putting in the, uh, the notes here. So for example, 
in terms of the main character, internal balance, external balance, what can we say about Jean Valjean? Is he, does he have, uh, what are some of the, um, what are behaviors, his actions that show internal balance? How about Jerome to tell us? Self-reflection. No, reflection. What was the word? Reflection. Reflection. Mm -hmm. Self-reflection. Yeah. Yes, I would agree. Self-reflection. Um, uh, he, he, uh, he is trying to, I would say, trying to uh, balance his need to survive with his need, with his uh, moral compass, shall we say? Anything else with internal balance for this episode of Jean Valjean? Internal balance is uh, how it works with the desire, anger, and logic. This is okay. what we need to, to see the um, the status of these three components, mind components. Well, then let's look at external. And the uh, internal balance is uh, in various um, in, in various state for um, for Jean, uh, depending depending on the situation. It's not uh, something that is constant. According to the situation, he has a different internal balance. The same thing for the external balance. Give us an example. For instance, he is hungry. What to do? He is going to steal to survive. So okay? is he, he, he is rich. He has no problem to steal to, to survive. It's a different state. Well, he does have a problem, though, to steal. You, if you, if you read that passage, you will see he goes through. I think it's it takes him an hour, a whole hour, to consider his action. He doesn't just jump in and and steal. Uh, yeah, so there, he he has a, a logic going on. Okay. Yes, he does. On how to do it. That's right. Okay. The desire is to survive. He is hungry. That's the desire. Can I just say a quick thing? So when he starts off to steal, I don't think he has logic. I think the logic of my opinion, of course, appears when he starts to see the bishop. I think that's my opinion. Like before that, his desire to steal was in control. And then when he gets into the room and he finally, that's, that's what I... I, I think that the bishop is the ex external balance that brings that struggle within him. Absolutely. I think it's very um, apparent that he, in his mind, the, um, the, the actions that he took uh, become very clear after the bishop provides that re redeeming moment for him. What I'm trying to say is that... Um, upon entering the house, upon sleeping in the bed, upon waking up between that time and actually taking uh, and stealing the objects, there was, there was quite a bit of, uh, quite a bit of um, uh, right. thinking going on. Right. That's why I was, I was afraid to say, I, I, I hesitated to say that he didn't have any uh, moral compass. He didn't have uh, logic, any logic. I think he still has it, but you know, we can leave it off. All right, no problem. No, 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 no. I was just, I'm saying like he went through that struggle, but then when he set his mind that he's just going to steal it, when the, when he saw the bishop, that's when I believe that it went back to the struggle again. Like he set his mind to do it. He was going to do it. And then that whole scene with the door and the, and his exaggeration of the sounds and then finally seeing the bishop, I think the bishop brought him back like made him struggle 
to the way he was uh, prior to stealing. Well, uh, may I continue? Please. Uh, in these lessons, we must design, uh, distinguish when we have the internal and the external balance and what, e what is causing it. Then we describe the characters. For example, uh, I uh, refer to Victor Hugo about Greece. He said that the world is, is Greece that is expanding. And Greece is the world that is shrinking. Reading is like food and water. The mind the, that does not read lo loses weight, like a body that does not eat. Philosophy at its core gives us the greatest distribution of great thinkers in the world like today, who go on how to better life and lives and today the emotions of the characters and first of all, the negative emotions of Blazan who by law impose punishment, but according to him, it is survival in life and exaggerates to steal. And an external balance that thoughts and emotions are exaggerated for good. Jean Valjean, according to the decision of the court, was free after 19 years in prison. Mm -hmm. He suffered the prison with an internal balance of a virtuous man, according to Plato. But at the same time, his thoughts were always to escape. So in this case, we have an external balance of Aristotle where thoughts and actions are neither incomplete nor exaggerated. He was ac accepted by the Bishop of Deed and decided to change his life. Here we have an internal balance of the Plato's mode, model because within seven years, he became the first citizen of the city and, fac and factory owner. This effort was the result of an internal balance of virtue that led him to the success of a virtuous life. Later, after Fantine's death, he takes her daughter under his protection and kept her safe, showing in this way the greatness of his soul and internal balance of virtue with some exaggeration since the girl was foreign to him. When a man had been arrested and was to be tried as 24,601, Vazar refused to let an innocent, innocent man go to prison for him and con confessed to the court that he is, he is the, the prisoner of uh, uh, 24,601. In, uh, in this case, we have the thought that led Vazar to, dis, to, to dictate himself as an, an, an exaggeration of internal balance of Plato above all the truth, even if lead him back to prison. This is the way that we make the, the characters and express uh, the uh, internal and the external uh, balance. Thank you. Excellent, Dimitri. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, shall we continue with the bishop? Or shall we correct uh, what I have written here? Okay, Ellen, you may have the floor. Yes, I know. That's what I'm, I'm asking. Uh, shall we continue with the bishop or do you think we need to do more work with uh, the uh, Valjean character?
Okay, let's go to the bishop. Um, I would, I would say that the bishop uh, displays a very platonic, if I can use that word, um, equilibrium of his nature. I mean, he 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 is he he is what he is. He believes in in what he does. He has no second thoughts, and so he displays a uh, a. A, an internal balance of, of equilibrium of, of the Plato type, the Platonic type of, of internal balance. Is, is that what others see as well? Yes. Okay, so he's just, he displays justice. Uh, is there something else we can, what about external, uh, the external factors? He is in the midway of virtue, in the mid space of virtue. He does so not exceed, exceed any limit. He doesn't exceed limits in your, in, in, as far as what you see. He he does not. Uh, he he's actually, but he, he does. His actions do show a, and this is not me talking, but the character. His actions show a disrespect for the society's laws. Yeah. Just like Antigone. Uh, not exactly like Antigone, but uh, he's uh, really? within the mid space bounds. Well, this is your opinion. I think, uh, can we hear somebody else? What, what does somebody else think about? Uh, I'm what I'm trying to get at is uh, the, the, the interpretation of the characters through the model that Professor Hadzopoulos is, is, um, is teaching us. I'm trying to get at that. Um, <laughs> he's governed by, um, he's governed by a religious law versus a civil law. That's what he is, I believe, basing his decision. Um, Okay. Like in other, they use the word clemency, you know, like he is in essence saying, I'm going to give you another chance to redeem yourself here, but mm -hmm. it, not under civil law, under God's law, because we forgive under God's law. And there's mm -hmm. once we have forgiveness, and that's what I believe he is. So is that, a, would that, would that put him into that, that middle space of equilibrium? How, how does how does he do, how does that work? Yeah. If he if he is he, he, yes he's of course he's he's governed by religious law, uh, let us say. But but in order to do that, he must disobey the civil law. So right. how does how does that work with this whole balance issue? If you, I think if you follow that issue, I think he's off balance then because he's disrupting the order of society, I guess. I'm just throwing it out. Just, I'm just, that's, that, I'm not I, saying. I'm, I'm just typing some right. things that I think make a little bit of sense. Not right. because we, we agree, okay? We're just no, describing. No, no, no. Just, yeah, just, of course. He is dis he's disrupting the order of society because yes. he did steal, but at the same he time, is. He's trying to provide some sort of, you know, he's, he's trying to make a, a, a man that's not righteous back to be righteous. Through, I guess through guilt, <laughs> in essence, you know what I mean? Uh, I'm not exactly. You know. why, I'm sorry, why, do you, uh, why did you use the word guilt? I may have missed that, I'm sorry. I, I mean, for him to say it that way, because that caused, by him doing this, it caused a struggle inside Jean, you know what I'm trying to say? So, so like, if he can say those things to him, like, he's like, I am buying your soul in essence so that you can be better. 
um, I, you know, it's, it's, you know. So, so the, the, the uh, Valjean's guilt arises out of the bishop's actions. Is so, that what you, so like, that what you, yeah, or not? So, so I, here's where I have like a little bit of confusion between this, like, while I think the bishop causes, is the catalyst to cause all this, I think it sets what we're saying about internal and external balance with Jean, it sets him to be more balanced in society. I don't know how to explain this, but yet the bishop is disrupting is disrupting the norm of society. Do you understand? Like by the bishop doing what he's doing, yeah. he's kind of, yes. I believe he's creating a balance within Jean that create that's within the parameters that we we discuss. So I think I, I understand what you're saying. It's very interesting point, Stella. What you're saying is that by the bishop, um, uh, by the bishop not not obeying the laws of of the society, he's creating a a person, or he's helping develop a person to be to obey the laws of society. Within those, right, within those parameters of the horse, like we said, the way you know the way he showed. There's a limit, an outer limit, and a, a and a lower limit. Like Jean now is going within those limits. He's he's following those norms. Yes. Oh, you know, yes. you know, like I guess, like in essence, the bishop is pulling one a little, but then John is balancing it by doing good in the end. I don't. I mean, I'm just yeah. I, that's what I maybe you know. Very yeah. interesting point what you bring up. So uh, balance yeah, is the, yeah. I'm trying to find. The, is, like I'm is, trying to find the slide where Mr. Hatzopoulos um, was saying with the horses, you know, is the bishop the one that's pulling the horses, you know, and John is within those. I, I, you know, I'm just trying to figure it out. Like I'm a little, you know, it's well, this is new to me, so I'm just it's new to me too. <laughs> I'm trying to understand it as well, yeah. and it's good that we're able to to talk about it. And I think, um, yeah, that's my opinion that John becomes within the norm and the bishops outside of the limits. Of the, you know, like, and and so the uh, would there be? Okay, so we're back to the bishop then. Uh, and by the way, anything that I write here, you can change or oh, you no, it's come. okay. I just, yeah, I'm um, yeah. so yeah. back to the bishop is. Can we can we say that there is a balance developing in the bishops? Actions. I don't know about that. Yes, I don't, but we, I don't, we, have, we have to take into consideration that the society is out of balance. The laws that the society has, they are out of balance. They do not represent the people. That's the reason that creates the hunger and the, the forces people to go stealing. Okay. That, well, that, that is true as, as a work of fiction. That's what Hugo is trying to portray. Exactly. So we have to take, we have to just take that at face value. All right, that the, the society is, is out of balance, of course. Right. So is putting it back in balance then? Is that what you're saying? That the bishop is putting it back in balance? He's, he's trying to put back in balance the same thing. Uh, uh, John, St. John, how you call him? I, I agree. I agree with you. I agree with you. Attempting to uh, to balance, to bring to um, bring equilibrium into the system of justice, something like that. Society. To, society, yeah, the system of justice. Okay. Um, well, this, this is good. I like the, the, the way that we're talking about it. And I have a better understanding because it's, this is uh, uh, obviously new to me. And I hope it, it's helping uh, the other members of the class as well. Uh, shall we go on or shall we? Uh, I just have, uh, I don't know if you want to talk about the society, you want to talk about any of the other characters. It's up to you. I thought maybe we could talk about um, 
not Jaber, but um, I had her name. There she is. Madame. Uh, she's right here. She's yeah. right here. Madame Magloire. I, I can say a few things. And the, if the, every, all the miserable situation starts from the society and the bad laws that has the society. The other thing I want to mention about uh, Javer is, is that the policeman is that uh, Plato in the Republic says that the guards of the city, they must be educated and not like dogs, you know, to bark some, someone they don't know to bark. Uh, and uh, only those, they, they are educated to understand that they are friends for the city. Mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. Over here, you see, we have this society that Victor Hugo describes in our society, that the guards, they are not educated. They take orders and they execute. Dr. Hazopoulos, I, may I just bring a point uh, to, uh, to this? Some of the most educated, um, most educated guards and officers were German Nazis. Okay? They were very, very educated. Um, so I don't know if education necessarily, maybe it's the kind of education. Education in and of itself. Education is to, to educate it is to have internal and external balance. Okay. The okay. Nazis, they don't have that. that. That I would agree with, but not if you say just <laughs> education, I would not agree with that. No, it's not to have a degree and know things, it's to have internal and external balance. Exactly. That's education. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Just, just a clarification. <laughs> That's right. So we start with the society and then we go down what's happening and the consequences. You have uh, uh, John St. John that uh, goes into various stages and uh, he has different levels of uh, equilibrium internal and external. Bishop is standard, has, you know, his own course and uh, it, it's okay. He tries to balance things. But the Javeris, the policeman, he's, uh, you know, totally out of balance, internal and external. Well, it leads to his understanding of that at the end, uh, leads to his suicide. That's he does, right. at the end of his life, he does realize that. Uh, that's really all I have. I, 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 I'll, you know, if anyone else would like to 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 speak to the um, to the work, uh, that's fine. Uh, I uh, I have a short story planned for next week. Uh, maybe some of you have heard of it. It's called The Beggar. Uh, Anton Chekhov. Has anybody yeah. read that? Yeah. That's um, a classic. Uh, so that's it for me. Thank you. I, I want to hear Jerome because. Uh, he tries to escape with the uh, eat less, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Trying to say something. You, you know the subject story. You are from the best philosophers in the world. Please, tell us something. Well, uh, thank you, John. Uh, I, that's a lovely compliment. I'm not sure that, uh, that it's actu accurate, but uh, look, um, there, there are some things about the way that we're looking at these uh, these situations and circumstances, and I think that um, you know last last week we we discussed some a part of the Theban play plays. Um, I think where 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 it's very difficult to to come to any conclusion in these matters is where we've got two principles or two schools of thought. We've got Aristotle and Plato. Those two do not mix. And trying to find answers to problems through either the Arist Aristotelian method, um, which essentially is about an external world, uh, you're really going to struggle to do that. You have, I think you have to draw the line in the sand and say, are we taking a, a, the platonic view as of idealism or are we going to take the, the notion of Aristotle's pluralism? Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, the overarching situation 
or sorry, the overarching principle of all of this is that where anyone is making a mistake or uh, appears to be, uh, you know, not well educated or not adjusting to the external world, it's essentially for one reason, and that is they haven't applied the principle of exenia. Now, I'm, I hope that you're all aware of what that is. That's a pretty straightforward word in Greek for sure. Mm -hmm. And it means that they were their, their level of virtue was based on the fact that they either were uh, extended kindness or uh, empathy in a situation or they did not. And that's where all of these tragedies, um, you know, live. That's the whole nature, that people are not kind, are not virtuous, because they, ha they are thinking of other factors, ex what they perceive to be external factors, perhaps. And that's why you will make sense of these tragedies, if you look at it from the principle of exenia, uh, and also, more importantly, as a as a, as for self reflection, look at it from the Platonic point of view rather than than um, Aristotle, because Aristotle really wrecked civilization. Um, so, uh, <laughs> you know, if you want to, if you really want to go back and look at these things from a from a, a pre Aristotelian viewpoint it will have a lot more relevance that's uh, just Jerome, my my little piece there jerome can i oh, did you use the word eugenia is that the word no, you use no eugenia x-e-n-i-a x-e-n-i-i i-a Right, so this is the common principle of what is good in the world. Senia is to um, think about the someone you don't know and take care of uh, of that. Well, that's know. that's one of its that's one of its uh, its its yeah. modern meanings, but the original principle was the basis upon working or, or looking after other people. So your That's outlook right. is, is one of kindness rather than self-interest. Yeah. So in, in a world, in an Aristotelian world, you've got the world of self-interest, which is essentially the, the, what we live in today. It's not about others. It's about me first and then maybe you later. Whereas in the Platonic world, it is the, the notion of others first. And, and with that comes the... The, the relevance of service to others, but also, more importantly, self-interest is developed through giving to others. And so that, that is the real issue at stake here in education. Um, as I say, Plato and Aristotle do not mix in method or in principle. Uh, but uh, Aristotle, uh, I have a different opinion on that because the Aristotle was a student of Plato. He just followed Plato all this uh, time. And, well, he uh, was a student of Plato, but the issue is that the the times, and basically we're talking about the same times as the, the French era that you're discussing, were very, um, were very, uh, you know, tyrannical. You, you were living in the time of the Pisistratids, where Athens was becoming a super state. Oh, sorry, Greece. Well, it wasn't Greece in those days, of course, but that that uh, that civilization was becoming a super state and expanding globally. Um, very similar to what we have at the moment. So, um, I, when you say that Aristotle. Well, Aristotle was completely different to Plato because Aristotle was forced to, to, to state that there is an external world. But, Plato uh, never said that. But uh, you see that the internal balance, which is for Plato, it's absolutely correct. It must be an absolute uh, balance. But Aristotle, with the mid space of virtue, takes that 
and gives you not exactly absolute correct, but he gives the mid space. And the mid space is actually a parameter of the design of universe, like I said, because nothing in universe is perfect. And the reason there well, is- John, this... John, 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 there in what you're saying is a very Aristotelian view. From Plato's point of view, there was no and could not be a universe. Okay, so once you start to say there is a universe and it was designed, then you're bringing in notions like God and other factors to substantiate your view of an external world. This is not Plato. This is Aristotle. So you, know, you will not find, you know, a, a, an answer to the issues in Aristotle. For myself, it doesn't matter if it is Aristotle or Plato. What I am well, I think it does, John. It does. I'll tell you why. Because if you understand Plato, you'll have a different understanding of yourself. If you understand or accept Aristotelian views, then you will believe in other things. Well, I, I must tell you myself, I am not affected either by Aristotle or Plato. I well, am I think you are because what I am, all right? I look at them and I pick up whatever I feel it, it is important. It, it is important from each one of them or from any other, you know? And uh, this is my, my goal is to work out for a better world out of this mess we have today or better education or and uh, also the other thing is to use this basis they develop and the advance to uh, be able to handle current problems don't stay I, there you sorry. know and just uh, uh, debate only who is better who did the if uh, what, uh, you know, the one did, I am uh, following that and uh, I don't follow the other. I don't care about that. Well, All you may not care about it. You may not care about it, but it's going to handicap your ability to solve problems and make the world a better place. The principle by which the, the world can be a better place rests entirely within you, not externally. But uh, the universe is there. I mean, we John, can... John, 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 excuse me. You've just assumed there is a universe. Well, where did that come from? Where is that? What is the universe? Could you repeat that, please? Could you repeat that, what you just said, please? I, I just said that John has assumed that there is a universe. Where is the universe? Where is it? Uh, within human dimensions, there is. Well, hang on, hang on. Well, when you say there is, where we, is it? Where is it? If we, if we, uh, you know, raise such a question, we go out of the human dimensions. No, it's not a human issue. It's one of self. Your issue. You're, you're please, assuming do me, do that me there a are favor. things. Please do me a favor. We have not much time. Uh, okay. I'll give I'll give the floor to Stella because she didn't speak at all. No, I spoke. I spoke. <laughs> I'm just I'm actually no. I'm actually fascinated by this because you know Jerome is bringing up you know a uh, a very interesting point that I never really looked at it that way. So for me, it, this is a very interesting conversation. I know that there's debate going on, but it's good to have debate because that's how you learn different things and that's how you get to thinking. So for me, I find this very interesting that, you know, the way Jerome is putting this into perspective. So, um, but I also believe in, you know, with the, what's going on to society today, we are becoming a more selfish society. It's always about me and it's always about the now because like I see it everywhere I turn. They're so, um, and I just, I think that there is a huge imbalance right now in society with everything. So, yeah, that's basically, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, if you look at it, uh, thank you, Stella. If you look at society as a reflection of the self, uh, then, you know, we're, we're, it gives us an opportunity to do something about it. 
but we can't change what appears to be external. We can change our attitude and what we do in relation to that. So it essentially comes back to the principle of exenia. So once you I, start to give to others and once the kindness factor kicks in, your life gets better. So wait, let me. So I just want to add something to that. I think you can influence, and I'm going to tell you how I believe as a mother, and I'm not, you know, um, I raise my kids with certain values and sort, certain morals. And now that they're on their own, they see what other people are out there. So I've been, this is like a really weird example, but I'm going to just explain to you. So my son had a first girlfriend who ended up telling him that she was stealing from goodwill. So he turned to me, he goes, I cannot date this person because I don't have the same values and morals as this girl. I cannot be with someone like that. So I think that we, me raising my children in a certain way with certain, what I believe are standards that society, I don't want to say accept, but are, you know, good and decent that I think we can your, your standards right your standards your it's family really standards. Standards. It's, it's not even my standards it's stealing is wrong wherever whosoever standards they are it's just it's just wrong I mean sometimes like in the story he has to feed himself different story but if you're just stealing just the thrill of stealing that's just wrong so I agree with Jerome that once you start doing good and me by me raising my kids this way and showing them what I'm doing mm -hmm. they're learning through me so I think that also raising your kids a certain way, uh, your children a certain way um, can impact, can change society, not just by just, you know, it's just setting out the boundaries and limitations for them in terms of what's right and wrong. So I'm just saying, I'm not trying to say you're wrong, Jerome. <laughs> oh, no, no, I, I understand that. Um, well, I see that. Let me just say one thing and then I'll stop. I see value in both of these great philosophers. You are right, Jerome, that uh, Plato is more in, interested in the intrinsic human, what, what, the, the, what the human brings to the, the table naturally. Aristotle is more interested in developing into a good person and the development and how society affects that person, more of an interplay. I think that there's, there's room for both in our discussion. And as Dr. Hazopoulos is trying to do, to integrate, to integrate both of these approaches into uh, a mid-space where we can reform, improve education. Just my two cents. Well, you know, I, I think that Plato and Aristotle are mutually exclusive. It's like oil and water. I don't think you can mix the two. And, and particularly to, to create a methodology in order to solve a problem is going to be extremely difficult. So these, the, what we're really talking about here is ontological issues, not social issues. We're talking about what the self is rather than what it appears to be. Uh, so, you know, the, the bifurcation, as they call it in history, in, in thinking and in, in uh, ancient wisdom, started at our, our stall. That's where the world went wrong. Uh, and I, I just can't accept that you can use both of them. Sure, you could use one to prove the other or disprove the other. But by using both of them, this this is a flawed tech, te you know, a flawed, uh, uh, you know, um, process. We, you know, we are not going to find a better way of educating kids by using Aristotle. I don't think Plato said that 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 uh, human beings are born innately with wisdom. There's always he he. I have to go back and read my Plato, The Republic. But well, he, I'm not sure where, where does he, wisdom he, come he into never, that? He never said that we're born, we're innately born with wisdom. Well, Did he ever say of that? Course, of course, he wouldn't say that because wisdom is a concept. It, it, it's a concept. He says yeah, well, that we aspire, we aspire, human, human should aspire to wisdom. How is that different than what Aristotle is saying? Aristotle is saying that, um, we, um, that we, we do it with effort, with diligence, uh, with reacting 
to situations, I think he took it a step farther, further than Plato. I think he took Plato's ideas and developed them. I don't think it was a, um, I don't think it was the, a, 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 an up and an overthrow of Platonic ideas. I don't think Aristotle meant to destroy Plato or to. Well, uh, well, uh, uh, to the contrary, there because uh, Aristotle's view was external creates internal, and Plato, Plato's principles were based on. And his wisdom was based on internal creates external. It's just so simple. John, what do you think about that? Well, uh, I have totally different uh, view of that. I said, first of all, I understand if if I ask if I start a philosophical uh, uh, talk, I have to put some bounds on it because if we are talking about ontology and we start uh, um, raising questions, what is universe and things like that, then we go out of human dimensions. Human dimensions is the five senses we have and uh, our thinking. It, but uh, we cannot, and if we want to deal with metaphysics, we don't have to go away from the logical bounds. I mean, metaphysics for me is to go a little bit uh, further, but uh, staying close to the logic, okay? Because metaphysics, you, you get lost, you finish. If you start, you know- Well, you know, with-, with... The, the issue with physics is, or the natural world, according to Aristotle, is that it can't be proved. But the indubitable of Plato is that the self exists. And this is the only singular thing that we know. That is it. In the whole evolution of humankind, we only know one thing, and that is the self. When you start talking about the senses and the universe and the empirical world, it's just a model, John. It doesn't work anymore. Physics doesn't work. No one's proved it. Atoms don't exist. Matter, these sort of things. These are not important. These are concepts. They're Aristotelian-based concepts. One the, issue the... For, the issue for Plato is the self what is, what exists. And that is, should be the starting point of any philosophical inquiry, not the notion that, that, that you can approach things from two different philosophies. The, the, the one is continuation of the other for me. No, no not at all. It's like I, I show you the model of the internal balance, for instance, that uh, Aristotle is continuation of Plato, gives us not the exact balance, but the tolerance within the balance, the midway of virtue. Because all, for me, all the development of Aristotle is the midway of virtue. All right, well, well, well what is the answer in Aristotle for attaining virtue? In Aristotle, knowing, he said his quote, famous quote, uh, knowing yourself is the beginning of wisdom. I mean, that's Aristotle. Knowing yourself is the beginning of wisdom. I, I'm equating okay, but, but talk, wisdom here, with virtue. Here talking, right? Okay, here we're talking about the attainment of virtue. So from an Aristotelian point of view, how do you, how do you gain or grasp virtue? What is it? It is the action. Well, how, how do you how do you attain virtue from Aristotle? It's the well, midway of the action, not to be defect or uh, excessive. We have no more time, uh, please, for the next time, to have the right method. Each one has to analyze the characters and prepare with an indication of what the act is that creates the internal and external balance 
and how it is dealt with. So thank you for tonight and good night to everybody. Bye, Jerome. Bye, Stella. Good night. Bye. Good night. Nice. Good day. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Good day.